So here's an introduction to x-ray diffraction. Like any other x-ray experiment, we have the same basic components. We have an x-ray tube to generate x-rays, we have a sample that we want to analyze, and a detector to count the x-ray photons. So why do we use x-rays for XRD? Well, it's because the wavelength of x-rays is on the same order of magnitude as the spacing between atoms in a crystal structure. Common wavelengths for XRD might range anywhere from 0.7 angstroms up to about 2.3 angstroms. And what allows this diffraction phenomena to occur is something called Bragg's Law, seen here in the bottom right. 2d sine theta equals lambda. Now we're not going to derive all of Bragg's Law today, but we will talk about a couple of the variables. d represents the interplanar spacing. So this is the spacing between planes of atoms within our crystal structure. And since a crystal structure is three-dimensional, each one will have a characteristic set of d-spacings. Lambda represents the wavelength of the x-rays used in the experiment. Most commonly, copper x-rays are used. This has a wavelength of 1.54 angstroms. Now, for any d-spacing and wavelength of x-ray, there's going to be some angle in which the diffracted x-rays will be in phase with each other. And when that occurs, we say that the Bragg condition is fulfilled. So we're we are fulfilling that Bragg condition. And when we fulfill that Bragg condition, those waveforms of the x-rays, when they're in phase, they'll add together and the signal will be amplified. Now, if we're at the wrong angle and that Bragg condition is not being fulfilled, those x-rays will cancel each other out and the signal will be suppressed. Now, since a crystal structure has many of these d-spacings, there's a whole set of d-spacings, uh, it's important for us in any given x-ray experiment to measure a wide range of angles to try to fulfill as many Bragg conditions as possible. So when we see a diffraction pattern like we see here, each peak represents a particular angle where the Bragg condition is fulfilled for a d-spacing in our crystal structure. When we look at a diffraction pattern like this, there's three things that we're interested in. There's the peak locations, the peak shapes, and the relative intensities. Uh, the peak locations, that's going to give us information about the phase composition of our material. The peak shapes will tell us about the crystallite size. And the relative intensities will help us with quantification if we have a mixture. So what can we do with XRD? Since we're probing the crystal structure of a material, we can answer the most fundamental question and determine if our material is crystalline or not. If we have a crystalline material, we can do some qualitative phase analysis and identify the different crystalline components in our sample. Once we know what we have, we can then take, take it to the next step and do some quantification. There are some more advanced techniques that would allow you to calculate crystallite size, if there's any micro strain built up within your crystal structure, and if you're synthesizing new compounds, you can even solve crystal structures using XRD. What's important here is that XRD is giving us information about the crystal structure, the crystallinity, and the phase composition of our samples. We're not directly measuring the elemental composition like you might do in an X-ray fluorescence technique. However, if we know something about the phase composition, we might be able to draw some conclusions about the elemental composition, but we're not measuring it directly. In this first example, we're going to look at some silica polymorphs. Silica is SiO2, and the most basic building block is a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygens, and this forms a tetrahedron. And you can put, link these tetrahedron together to form different crystals. In particular, quartz and cristoblite are the most common. If we look at the short range order here, we can see that in both quartz and cristobalite, each silicon atom is surrounded by four oxygens. But the way each of those building blocks is linked together is different. And that's reflected in the diffraction patterns that we see. Quartz and cristobalite have different peak locations and different peak intensities. It's almost like a fingerprint that allows us to identify that particular crystal structure. Now, if you look at this third example, the silica gel, you can see we have the same basic building blocks, silica, silicon atoms surrounded by four oxygen, but there's really no rhyme or reason as to how those tetrahedra are connected to each other. It's all just random. So since we don't have any long range order in silica gel, we see that in the diffraction pattern. We don't see any sharp peaks. Instead, we just see this broad amorphous hump in our background. And this is something that you can quantify. There's a couple different industries that uh, this is very important to. So if you take the area 
of the amorphous contribution represented here by blue and the crystalline contribution represented in red, you can make a ratio and calculate how much is amorphous and how much is crystalline. In this example, it's about 85% amorphous and 15% crystalline. You can also look at pigments. This is very important for people looking at art or maybe some folks in forensics, where the, particular, uh, the presence of a particular pigment might indicate authenticity or provenance of a particular object. In this case, we're going to look at a couple white pigments. Um, titania dioxide and zinc oxide are the most common white pigments used nowadays. And while you could use an elemental analysis technique to differentiate between the two here, only XRD can distinguish between the two titanium dioxide uh, crystals. So anatase and rutile are both common in white pigments. And since they have different crystal structures, they're going to have, uh, that's going to affect other properties of the crystal as well. So uh, reflectivity and refractive index are going to be affected. And if you look at any white pigment, you might see both of these, or just one of them, and you might see them in different ratios. This particular white pigment is dominated by rutile. And we can see that here by the very tall red peaks. There's only a little bit of anatase represented by the very small blue peaks that we see down here in the background. Now for this particular example, we've done some semi-quantitative analysis where we look at the heights of the peaks and do some calculations to, to quantify it. So in this case, it's about 99% rutile and about 1% anatase. Another example is microdiffraction. So in this case, instead of grinding up our sample into a nice fine powder, we're looking at it in situ. Occasionally, you'll come across samples that you don't want to destroy and you would much rather preserve. So in this case, we have a rock and there was a, a bunch of blue crystals within it. And we wanted to analyze just that blue crystal and whatever else was present within that blue crystal. So we identified a spot um, within it that covered both the white streaks that you see and the blue crystal itself. And this is about a one millimeter area that we're looking at. And you can see even within that one millimeter area, there's about half a dozen different minerals that were present. It's very complex. And the more complex your, your material gets, that's going to be reflected in the diffraction pattern you see. You'll see a lot more peaks and a lot more peak overlaps. With your XRD data, you can also do some quantification. Now, there's many different quantification techniques, but by far the most common is something called Rietveld. Rietveld quantification allows you to input some information into, into a model, things like the instrument parameters that allow the model to calculate the instrument function, and crystal structure information, so it can model where the peak locations are and what the relative intensity should be. And based on a bunch of different parameters, the software is going to model, uh, create a synthetic pattern to match the data that you collected. And based on all of these calculations, it will output the weight percents of each of the phases that you're wanting to quantify. Now, the advantage of this method is it's standardless. Um, and you can also quantify multiple crystalline and amorphous phases simultaneously. So Bruker offers a whole line of diffractometers to do all of these different types of measurements, um, all the way from the bench top that's great for looking at powders, all the way up to the D8 Advance and D8 Discover platforms that might be better for micro diffraction or two-dimensional XRD. So this has been an intro to XRD. Thanks for listening.